Hey guys, thanks for tuning in and watching. I hope you enjoy me taking you through this shoulder and bicep workout. Please be sure to like and subscribe and let me know your thoughts below. I do feel like a lot of the generation is trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, and not even the newer generation, the newer athletes that are coming to the table, uh, they don't want to put in that brute, brute hard work. Uh, and not just having a good work ethic, but hitting the proper exercises in order to get those results. So you can come in and here and, and like work hard, but hit more machines and, and kind of dabble around what you really need to be doing. And that's chasing the compound movements because you need that to put on the size. And now as you get older with more experience and you develop a better physique, you could change that style. But you know, coming in here, if you're trying to throw on Ronnie Coleman muscle, you need to be doing Ronnie Coleman you know, exercises, man. I'm not saying obviously you have to do the same amount of weight as him, but the deadlifts, the heavy bench, again, dumbbells or barbell, whatever suits you best. I know I can't do bars, so I like to do you know, my a lot of dumbbell movements um, because I don't want to restrict the shoulder and, and cause more injuries than I already have. But it's super important that you come in here and you make sure that you kind of have a realistic idea of what's necessary to put on muscle, especially if you want to get on stage. Uh, I tore my chest two years ago, uh, getting ready for uh, 2018 Toronto Pro. And then uh, the next year, 2019, I had my shoulder and bicep surgery. I feel like a lot of the tightness from the shoulder was contributing to both of the injuries I actually had on my chest because I tore it again a year prior to that because just the restriction. So now that we remove the bicep tendon, they stitch everything up and I constantly get it worked on to open it up. My chest pumps are a lot better and I feel it's a lot less prone for injury. So. Uh, this is more Dorian Yates style, yeah, but yeah. typically I do like hitting a lot of angles and getting as much volume in there as okay. I can okay. because I feel like that's how you really build a 3D physique. Right, right, right. If you want to fill out all those angles, especially with the delts, you got to be hitting yeah. everything accordingly. Because right, right. if you're only doing heavy compound, then that's going to give you more of an up and down physique. Right, right, right. Don't expect to look 3D like, you know, Flex Wheeler or, you know, even Jay. Jay was huge on the volume and hitting angles. so. I like to consider myself an angles guy, okay. but my training does change uh, okay. train, change periodically depending on how I'm feeling. What are your thoughts on like the young guys doing like the pump workouts, the cables and all that, trying to avoid the heavy weights? You're not going to pack on muscle doing that. Uh, I mean, you might put on some muscle to yeah. a certain extent, but that's going to max out soon and then after you'll be like, just kind of wasting your time going through the motions. You can't, like this is a meat and potatoes yeah, yeah. of bodybuilding, it's a compound yeah, yeah. movement. Now, I wouldn't just stick to the compound movements because again, you don't want to look like like the old school bodybuilders who are more up and down. They don't have as much as the exaggerated sweeps and the, you know, certain body parts that just pop more that require angles to be hit. Uh, like a lot of guys back then didn't have rear delts because no compounds really hit rear delts. Right. So now isolating rear delts will help give you more of a 3D look right, right. and extend, you know, the shape of the arm from the side, from the back. So right, right, right. you just kind of got to, for myself, I just, to be honest with you, I just go with what the body feels right doing, so. Well, that's from years of training. Yeah, yeah, I've been training for about 13, 14 years, so. Um, certain things, man, the meat and potatoes, you can never really change. Right. There's only so many ways you can mimic, um, you know, a bench press. You could use dumbbells or flat, but right. if it's gotta be compound, it's between those two. So pick and choose and run with it. Okay. And this is my sponsor, gotcha. wherever it is, there. No, I mean, sometimes. But shoulders, is, it's not like, if I was doing quads, and I was gonna do quads, but I'm like, I don't know, first time filming, because it's gonna be like a nine hour workout, you know? Yeah. Next time, we'll get some quads in for you guys. Linkin Park right now. But it changes workout to workout. I like 
a good mix between rap and rock. So on my squat days and heavy days, I usually listen to more Tool, Mudvayne, the heavy shit to get you amped up. But otherwise, it's old West Coast stuff. So I'm actually listening to the rock now, but not typical for a shoulder day. But I always love changing it up. Yeah, I like changing things up. So it really depends on my mood, man. It's just always on leg day, it's always hard because my mood's always the same. And it's just you're out for blood. <laughs> Gotta preserve the elbows. No more sh surgeries. <laughs> Shoulders or elbows. How many have you had? Uh, what, like, Bodybuilding related surgeries? Yeah, uh, so in the last two years I had two. I had the, again, uh, bicep tendon removed and they repaired the labrum front and back because it's like bone on bone in the back, the cartilage is gone. And then uh, I had a torn tricep tendon, but uh, actually the PRP happened to fix that, so they ended up going in and just removing the bursa because that was really inflamed and causing a lot of pain. But I'm feeling good, fingers crossed. All I just gotta do is get rid of my heart disease and uh, I'll be ready to go. You I know it. That's a couple months from now. I have my next check-in with the cardiologist in February. Ah, sorry, end of January. <laughs> Slow and controlled. See how it's targeting that upper chest to hit the shoulder. A little trick of the trade, unless you have great genetics for chest, which I do not. You need help filling it out. So I do that on shoulder day. There's certain times to implement volume and there's certain times to implement the heavy compound. This is one of the times, especially towards the end of the workout, when you have your heavy movements uh, already complete, to just, like I said, we were talking about that isolation movement. This isn't quite isolation, but same mindset was just trying to fill out the muscle with as much blood as you can because your strength is gone but you're still looking to maximize the workout so you lower the weights and uh, increase the reps in my opinion so set two uh. yeah. now what made you decide to do a drop set just now uh, because I got 10 reps, it was a good amount of reps, but I feel like I could still get more blood in there. And seeing as, again, I'm about to finish the, this exercise, maximize, get as much blood in the nastiest pump as possible. Gotta be quick, can't wait too long. How often do you uh, change your training program? I change my training program usually Honestly, there's no set schedule. Um, to be honest with you, sometimes if I'm off like I am now for such a long period of time, I need to adjust because I'm a high volume guy and you can't be going high volume, you know, high set, heavy weight for long periods when you're off because then you just get the wear and tear effect. And I have suffered from that. So learning from that, I just kind of, even with this workout, I had my warm up sets leading to my working sets and I have two working sets and exercise. Um, but typically when it's like full off season, it's a lot of working sets and a lot less warm-up sets. Yeah. So then, uh, let's say you're on, do you just stick to a program indefinitely? Do you ever make adjustments? Uh, I always make adjustments, especially with my, my coach, Patrick. Uh, Patrick's great and he's got a good eye for that. So uh, essentially, we usually give things a chance to kick in and work. So every six weeks, between, between six to eight weeks, we're changing things up. And you know, I, I usually send in pictures bi-weekly. So at that point, with sometimes even every other week, we make small tweaks. Whether it's a little bit of the diet, a little bit of the cardio, a um, little bit of supplementation, there's always small things being changed. Nothing big, but always small things, right? Since I started bodybuilding, I've had many coaches. Uh, again, I started training before I was competing. I started uh, you know, getting ready for bodybuilding shows in 2008. So probably around like six, um, the longest period, the longest trainer I had was uh, Eric Deloro. We were together for about 
four or five years. We did about nine shows together. So that's actually like half my career because I've done 19 so far. So I'll be going on my 20th in 2021. So what's the, uh, the most common reason for switching coaches? Um, just adapting to their style. It's not necessarily that you don't think that they're smart. I think all my coaches are smart. Um, I know with Eric, I left because uh, you, you learn so much you can from somebody and then after a while it's like you understand their methods and their philosophies and there's just no more you could learn from them so you know you move forward. It's nothing personal, a lot of it is just business and if you treat it like a business it depends what your goals are but I feel sometimes people feel trapped because they owe their loyalty to a coach but at the end of the day it's a service. So whether if I'm your coach or you look, you, you know, you, someone else is coaching you, if you feel you learn all you can from them and it's time to move on to learn more and different views, that's totally cool. It's not always personal. I'm cool with all my old coaches. So you just got to do what's best for you. Why do you uh, coconut water? I drink coconut water because it helps restore electrolytes. And uh, I usually was drinking carbon in the past when I was doing a lot of insulin, but uh, that's actually counterproductive because your body actually, the more you're digested and the more you could just shuttle the nutrients, it's gonna work in your benefit. If you have, you know, a hundred and something grams of carbs sitting in your stomach, you're actually, it could be counterproductive because you're not utilizing the blood as much to the muscles and it's going towards your stomach to help break down the food and the distribution. So this being a simple sugar, simple carb, right there. Um, it's not a lot, but it's just very efficient. So right into the bloodstream, right into the muscle, and again, it helps restore your electrolytes. So extremely productive. You guys should use it when you're training for sure. Are you the only one of your group of friends that trains? Yeah, uh, within my group of friends, I have a couple buddies that train. Um, one of them, actually my best friends, you know, he's a professional golfer. So his training is like more mobility and twisting. When I try to take him through a bodybuilding workout, I, he'll last halfway doing a, a fraction of the weight. But that's expected, right? Different, different sports require different kind of uh, training and dieting requirements for sure. So yeah. bodybuilding is like a pretty solitary sport. Bodybuilding is like a Spartan sport between, you know, the cooking, the eating, the training, you know, staying on top of your supplementation and your sleep and rest. You can be, you know, running around and being super, super crazy, you know, busy with, with things that are really taking a toll on your energy and expect to come in the gym and give it 120% every day. So it's uh, definitely a tricky balance. Hopefully in my off season, I'll be around like 290. Should be a safe, a safe mark for me. I don't want to get um, really out of shape. I want to keep tighter, which is why I always eat clean and I'm always doing cardio post training. So with my good habits, I feel like that's extremely attainable. And then uh, on stage, it'd be nice to be uh, you know around 250, depending what damage we could do this off season. So just gotta take things one step at a time. But I think for sure off season, um, first thing first things first, 290, and then we'll see what happens from there. <laughs> about well from so the last time I was I was on I was about 290 right now I'm like mid 230s um, so I didn't really lose all that much from the last surgery because at that point I was already you know off everything for a good seven months and I got the surgery probably two months ago so I mean I, I never stopped eating the amount I did even though I had to take the time off of the gym um, I was just getting more fat, but I was still getting the calories in. I was more paranoid of getting smaller than being soft. Right, right, right. So I know the softness will, you know, uh, it'll, it'll go away. Yeah. But if I have to start wearing smaller clothes and buying new clothes because all my current clothes are baggy, yeah, yeah. that would mind fuck me way too much. <laughs> so I was cool with that part of it. I figured at least I'm getting the meals in and I'm putting in that extra effort. Yeah, yeah. Being soft is cool, being small is not. <laughs> I notice you're like super conscious about your joints and, and everything. Extremely. Yeah. Borderline paranoid. When did that start? Uh, when I started, you know, noticing that um, I needed surgeries and I was getting PRP done like every other weekend. I've had every joint in my body pretty much PRP. 
my wrists, my elbows, my shoulders, my knees, you name it. So um, just being more precautious and conscious of it and trying to you know, make sure that comes to an end. Uh, I've just become a lot more in tune with stretching prior to training and even tra changing my training style up, especially when I'm off. So this is a, the sports of old longevity. It's not a race, it's a marathon. So you said you have uh, you have one sponsor? Or how many sponsors do you have? Uh, I have three sponsors. Uh, BioX, Jed North, and uh, actually a tanning salon here by my house. So I get free tanning, which I've kind of been taking advantage of lately. That's why I'm getting a little dark. I'm getting out of the Casper phase and into like the human looking phase. And then I'm gonna enter the like Spanish Latino phase, you know? So I like that dark pigment. It looks better, man, when you're, you know, it helps just bring out not only the life in you, but when you're training, yeah, yeah, yeah. helps bring out the, you know, the cuts and the contours and the, right, yeah. everything that you want as a bodybuilder. You never really want to be pasty white and, and soft and hairy, you know, it's, I feel like in the winter it's very common, yeah. especially for myself, I mean, you get lazy and, uh, yeah, not a good feeling though. I like being on point, so, tanning bed, <laughs> yeah, buddy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I plan on building a, a great brand, which I could benefit from and, you know, share with the bodybuilding community and the community in general. It doesn't just have to be the fitness industry to just help spread motivation, positivity and inspire people, whether it's inspiring them to get on stage, inspiring them to do a great body transformation or inspire them to, you know, get off their ass and start the business they've always wanted or just succeed in whatever it is they're doing in life. So it goes a lot further than just the gym. Uh, but also, I'm, I'm really into stocks and stuff like that, so um, you never know, I might be the next Warren Buffett. What, watch out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll be talking about Elon Musk, yeah, yeah. my main man. Please make sure you guys like it and subscribe.